Good morning, everyone. And we're going to begin this study, uh, continuing on Judges 15, finishing this off, and going into Judges 16. But can we now begin with a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful, Lord, for the time that we have to study. We're thankful for each person that participates or watches these videos. Um, we pray that your Holy Spirit can work in their lives, that your angels can watch over them. We are thankful for the light that you have been giving us in regard to our time, for the light for our feet. And we just pray, Lord, that we can be faithful and walk in that light, that we can reveal your character to those around us. Be with each person, bless them. And be with us in our study now through your, through your spirit. Help us to understand and to be able to share these truths with others. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so since uh, Thursday, there's just one little point that uh, um, I want to bring up. So we had, had basically finished off Judges 15. And um, uh, I just got this chart here. I just added a couple things to it. So one of the things you see is I, I put April 12th, um, 1533, on the first day of the first month. So this is when God first gave the calendar uh, to ancient Israel as far as the counting of the months. So that this month shall be the beginning of months, which is the month of Aviv. Um, and which is now called Nisan. So that's going to be the first day of the first month. And if we go to the first day of the first month, April 5th, 2030, uh, this is going to um, be a period of 1,301,000 days. And so we can look at this as um, uh, 13. So that 13 is the number that we can have uh, because 13 days, for instance, times uh, 1,440 minutes is uh, a symbol of July 18, 2020. Uh, also, the 13th Baktun, um, which you can see this is the Mayan calendar here. Um, so it's kind of interesting that if we take this number and we write it in a Mayan date, of course, we have one extra zero here. Uh, but we just take off one of the zeros and we write this date in here. Um, then you could think, think of it as putting the 1301 in there, and just leaving the left, rest left over. This is um, the second month, the 12th day on the Islamic calendar, in the year 1435. That's the year uh, 2016. Um, and and this number here is also, if you take just the 1301, uh, 2013, yes, 2013, pardon me. Um, and if you take the 1301, this is the 212th prime number. So I'm just getting rid of these zeros here at the end. But we also have symbols attached to this chapter, uh, the 1000 at the end, and also the 300. So you could write this number as 1,300,000 and 1,000, right? So we had the 300 foxes there at the beginning of this chapter, and then we had the 1,000. Um, is it at the beginning of this chapter? Seems like so long ago. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's gonna be the 300 foxes there. Wow, it's a lot in this chapter. We've been taking a long time putting this one on a line. Um, and then, of course, this 12th day of the second month, you can see that the 212th prime represents February 12th. Well, February 12th, 2022, um, that's going to be Odilio's presentation. So, so these things tie us um, to the, these two presentations again, December 25th, 2021. And February 12th, 2022, the 49 days between there. And remember that this is going to start out with these two um, uh, studies uh, addressing uh, Pentecost, right? So there's 
49 days in between here. Just let me take this here. Right. So, so we understand the symbol there for, for Pentecost, the wheat harvest. So any, anything else that I'm missing here? I mean, we could put lots of other first days of the first months in here because we have the first day of the first month being 9-11. We have the first day of the first month in Millerite history. So we've already addressed those in different diagrams. Um, and probably I should draw out some of those again. But now we have uh, the first day of the first month in 1533 BC tying us to this history, to our history. And we know 1533 days from April 11th, 1840 to October 22, 1844. So, so that 1533 is also a symbol in and of itself. A any thoughts about this? Well, I'm looking at the 212th prime, and that would go with the uh, February 12th, 2022. Yeah. And yeah. the AH, does that, does that have, have to do with the Hajj? Yeah, that's in the year of that's the Islamic. Hijra, however you say that. Hijra, so that, yeah, whatever. Yeah, so that's the, yeah, the, when he fled Mecca, right? And Right, okay. Now, and it's interesting too, the first day of the first month um, in, in the Gregorian calendar. So if you go to the Gregorian calendar and you look at the start of the Islamic calendar, the first day of the first month is going to begin at sunset on July 18th. All right, so here I can show you this. So when we go to the Islamic calendar here, and here you can see I have this um, 130100, right? That's the, that number 130100. And that's going to be the 12th day of the second month. But if I go to the first year, first month, first day, you can see here, um, July 19th is the first day of the first month. It happens also to be the first day of the fifth month which is kind of interesting on the biblical calendar. And this is the first day of the first month on the Islamic calendar. But the first day of the fifth month doesn't begin um, at midnight. It begins at sunset. So technically, if we were to go back from midnight, we'd go to sunset, it would be the 18th. So July 18th at sunset is the first day of the first month in the first year of the Islamic calendar. So we see the July 18th symbol attached uh, to the Islamic calendar in that way. So the fact that we have this first day, of the first month here at the beginning of the end, and we can connect that to July 18th as a symbol, I think is, is pretty significant. Now, if somebody was to take, you know, all of this again, and we've talked about this as far as uh, time setting is concerned, you know, people would be um, inclined if they believed in that we could predict events to try to use this information to say what's going to happen on April 5th, 2030. But what we do know is it as it is at least um, a, a symbolic date. Now, it could be that after that time passes, we could look back and see the significance of it. But I still don't believe that we can we can know in advance what April 5th, 2030 would mean as far as an event on a line. That's that's the position I take. Any any other thoughts on, on what we see here in front of us?
Now, the number of years here is um, 3,562 years. And it's kind of interesting that um, if we were to take uh, an average year, so let's see if I can. So if we were to take, you know, the average length of a Jewish year, it's the same as the average length of a solar year, right? So a Jewish year can be as little as 353 days in length and as much as 384 in an embolismic year. But if you took all of the Jewish years and you added them up, they would and 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 average them, they would be the same as our solar year, right? Because uh, the Jewish year is adjusted, right? Just like we have a leap year every four years to average it out, they just have a leap month every two or three years to average it out. Now, when we look at that, that's you know roughly three hundred and sixty-five days, right? So we have three hundred and sixty-five and a quarter. But we often just say the year is 365 days in length. Now, this number then, I'm just going to put it in here. Uh, if we were to take this number and to cut it in half, um, we would get two different, uh, we would get um, uh, a number, which is 1781. That is, if you cut this in half, so you take half of this period, it'd be 1871 years. And so this is maybe a little bit of a math trick. I don't know how to sort of look at it here. Um, I'll just copy this box. I'll do it here just so you can see what I'm doing in my head. So if I take 187, is it 1871? 1781. There we go. 1781. Now, what do we notice about this number? Same combination as July 18. Okay, same combination. Now, remember, if we take um, uh, 187 days, so that would be an ordinal count. Right, so I'm going to go backwards here. I'm going to go 187. That's the number of days from the spring equinox to the autumnal equinox. And if I go forward, 178, that's the number of days from the autumnal equinox to the spring equinox. Right, so 178 plus 187 is 365. So so this represents the year, um, but it also reps, represents July 18, 2020. Does that make sense? Am I, am I just doing a math trick? Is that significant? Any thoughts? Is that kind of neat or not? Because the whole thing about this is this this is all a confirmation of July 18, right? That's that's what we find in the story of Samson. Yeah. So Ran says we have been seeing combinations are relevant. Okay. And and I think this would be pretty significant in in the context of what everything that we have here. Okay. Brother Theodore, I was busy reading something. What was it? What was the question? Just whether that 1781, if I read it one way, three digits, and the other way, three digits, that I get 365. We already dealt with the 300 and the 65. So 365 becomes a symbol, right? Now, right. that is a comp 
acclimant to if 365 is a year, the, co the complement to 300 is the number 65, right? And the complement to 187 is 178. Does that make sense to people? Yes, it does. Okay. So, so the fact that the number of years from when the calendar is first given to April 5th, 2030, these are both first days of the first month, which represents an entire year, which is 365 days. If we take that number of years and we divide it in half, right? We're going to get this number that forwards and backwards uh, represents um, represents uh, the year, right? So, so I think in the context, you know, one of the things I wanted to comment about dealing with numbers. So we have all of these symbolic numbers, but you know. There is such a thing as coincidences. That is, coincidences do exist. Um, you know, but when we have a structure bit based upon biblical prophecy, I don't think we can argue that something is just a coincidence. But I know that sometimes people will look at something and they will say, oh, I counted a number of days from such and such a date. So you pick some date and you count and you see some event is going to happen on such and such a date. Or you might even predict that something is going to happen on such and such a date because it's so many number of days from some other event. Is that a valid way of looking at a number? So let's say I was going to pick today and I'm going to say, well, 187 days from today, because I think today is significant, right? Maybe I had a dream or something happened and I'm just, just going to say, well, 187 days from today, some event is going to happen like the close of probation or something. I mean, one is we can't predict events in the future. So we know that. That won't be part of any structure either. Okay, so it needs to be a part of a structure, right? Yeah, it's got and, to, it's got to yeah. be. Because I've seen some people do this with some dates. So, like they will measure from some event in our line that we already have, and they'll see some event, um, you know, something's going to happen, some celebration or, or some, you know, Earth Day or something like that. And they'll say, well, that's really significant that, you know, it's this far apart. But it's not part of a structure. That is, there's not, there isn't a second witness. There isn't, um, um, like when we're doing this here, we've been studying the book of Judges. And we've been getting these numbers and these structures from the book of Judges. Right? And, and from events that have been fulfilled in our history. And so when we have a, a symbolic date like April 5th, 2030, um, it just it bears witness to our lines where we are right now. But it's not meant to bear witness about what's going to happen in 2030, not directly. Now, maybe when we get to 2030 and that passes, then we can see how it applies. But mostly what we're seeing is that God's always giving light for our feet. He's not wanting us to look at a date in the future and sort of, oh, well, you know, we got lots of time or or that we are going to, you know, proclaim some message about April 5th, 2030. Um, so it, that's the way that I understand it. That these are wheels within wheels. They're all interlocked with each other. And if I, if I find that, you know, there's a certain number of days from some event, because there's tons and tons of events. I mean, there's tons and tons of things that we could find connections to. And, and this is what the evangelicals and the, you know, the Pentecostals do with time prophecy. Um, and so, you know, I've seen the counterfeit enough to know that it's a counterfeit and that it's, that when we're looking at these lines, if we do see something 
it needs to fit into the structure that we have. And, and not even just chronologically, it needs to fit into the structure meaningfully, right? That is, God has given us specific light. And, you know, he's been leading us to the upper room, for instance. And we have all these witnesses that keep telling us this. So, so I think it's, it's an important distinction that, and, and when somebody presents something, you always need to look at it with an open mind too. So it doesn't mean just because, uh, you know, somebody presents something and we don't see it initially. I mean, we need to look at it. And some of these things are just little minor, minor details. They're, they're not major details, but sometimes they can be helpful. Okay, so um, let's go back. So chapter 16. Uh, now, one of the things that's kind of interesting, when we look back at chapter 15, um, you know, we see Samson traveling here. Right. Samson visited his wife with a kid. Right. And we know this is in time of wheat harvest. So when we go to chapter 16, then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in unto her. And it was told the Gazite saying, Samson has come hither. And they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city. And were quiet all the night saying in the morning when it is day, we shall kill him. Now. Remember, Samson is, we're understanding his story uh, morally ironic. Now, when we look, look at this, um, what is it, This what are the symbols that are here? And, and how would we understand this? So we know that Samson is a type of Christ. He's a type of this message as well. Now, Gaza's a city of Great antiquity, it says here, it's situated between Raphia and Ascalon, 22 miles north of the former and 16 south of the latter, uh, according to the Antonine itinerary. Three miles from the sea, according to Arian, and 34 from Ashdod to As As Azotus, according to Diodorus Sicilus. Now, I don't know what we would get if we were to look at it now and how you measure distance between cities can vary, um, especially if you have different roads. Is it the fact that it's between Raphia and Ascalon, 22 and 16, is that significant? Any ideas on that? That he mentions Raphia is interesting. But, um, I don't see anything stand out in, initially concerning it. Uh, concerning Gaza. Or concerning the fact where it's how they're they're taking where it's situated. Yes. The, the miles and so forth. I don't know. Well, 22, we know, is, is a symbol of restoration. But um, anyway, we have these here. 16 is, is 8 plus 8. So, so the, I mean, we could take this, you know, this is just from a commentary, whether it's actually, you know, accurate or not, we don't know. But, but it is close to Raphia, and it's between Raphia and Ascalon. And where are we in our lines right now? I mean, it depends which line you're looking at. Because we do mark, mark Raphia different ways. Because we, we mark Raphia, we, we've marked Raphia as November 9th and Paneum as July 18th. We've marked it that way. Uh, we've also um, looked at December 25th, 2020, 2021 as Paneum. 
right? That was another suggestion. Uh, I think Odilio had that in his line, and it and and I sort of had that Raffia was a period of time going between November 9th, 2019 to July 18, 2020, and then Paneum would be the next period of time. Um, but we also have um, January 6th, uh, 2021, which is uh, the Siege of Washington. And um, that we've marked as Raffia in relationship to the Republicans and the Democrats. And so Paneum would be when the Republicans take over the United States again. But what would Ashkelon, Ashkelon be? I mean, it's not in the scriptures, you know, in this verse here, but we're going to take that there's Raphia, that they're going to use this reference. And, uh, or could it just, because what could Ashkelon symbolize? Even though it's not here in the scriptures, I realize that. It's just in a commentary. When I think of Ascalon, I think about uh, sun thou stand, a uh, sun stand thou still, still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ascalon. That's what I think of when I think of Ascalon. Am I stretching things here a little bit to look at Samson is, is between... Raphia and Ascalon here. Can we do that? Take something that's not particularly in the Bible. But see that this is going to relate to. Um, and here in Judges 1 verse 18, it says also Judah took Gaza with the coast thereof and Ascalon with the coast thereof and Ekron with the coast thereof. And so they often me mention Gaza and Ascalon together right this is an area of the philistines in the story of the golden emeralds the philistine returned for a trespass offering unto the lord for ashdod one for gaza one for ascalon one for gath one for ekron one so can we take this as a symbol that this represents uh, something with our lines because of Gaza. Okay, and then um, he saw there in Harlot and went in unto her. So how would we take this? And, and I also want you to note this chapter and verse, 16, verse 1. What is this? Well, 16th day of the first month. Okay, and from that you count to Pentecost, right? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm just looking at uh, Joshua, uh, okay. chapter 10. Um, verse 12. Okay. You're saying, you're saying Ascalon, but it says well, in the Valley of Ajalon. Oh, you're right. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, that's Ajalon. Uh, I apologize. Um, okay, so we won't use this one here. I was just thinking about the reference to time. Okay. But yeah, it's Agilon. Okay. So Judges 16, verse 1. This is going to relate to the 16th day of the first month. So that's going to be the day that the wave offering, right, the, the sh first sheaf, sheaf of ripe barley is presented. And in the previous chapter, we were dealing with um, uh, 
this was Pentecost, right? This is going to be the wheat harvest. And that's going to be 49 days or 50 days, however you count it inclusively or just cardinally, um, from the 16th day of the first month. So, so technically, um, Pentecost, that's going to be 49 days or 50 days from Colin's presentation. So we marked there um, February 12th, uh, 2022. That's going to be Odilia's presentation. The chapter 16 would be, if we're, if we're taking that 50 days representing Pentecost, then this would be Colin's presentation. Right? It'd be 49 or 50 days before. So, so if we're taking these two chapters, we're taking 15 and, and 16, we can see here we have this representation of the wave offering. And, you know, I just finished a paper on the wave offering. And, and this was in connection with our understanding of uh, the period that the manna fell. So we use that period that the manna fell, which is going to begin on the, the 16th day of the second month in 1533 B.C., and then you're going to have this um, um, go for 14,587 days, period of time from when the manna first falls to when it last falls. And then you're going to have the Sabbath, the 15th day of the first month after they cross the Jordan. And then on the 16th day of the first month, which is also a Sunday, um, the manna will cease. They go out to gather manna. There is none. And that's the day of the wave offering. And so we've been, been studying this in connection with this history. So if we say that this story here, that Samson went to Gaza, it's situa situated between Rafi, Rafi and Ascalon, not Agilon. Um, And then he's going to see a harlot and went in unto her, go in unto her, right? Um, and we're saying that this is representing... Colin's presentation, which happens uh, 49 or 50 days before Odilio's, and Odilio's is on Pentecost, a wheat harvest. That means Colin's is on the wave offering, right? That's how we're understanding this. So what does this mean, right? Remember, this is morally ironic, so so Samson is doing something which would not be good. Could this be Christ communicating to us through Colin's study? Because I believe the Colin study had light in it, has light, and, and that it's something that we need to study. Just like Odilia goes. They're not error. Just we need to put them all together, all of the light that God has given us. Anyone? So if we're looking at this from the ironic side. Yeah. Samson is representing the movement. Right? Yeah. And, and he represents Christ as well. But he, in this application, it's the movement. Okay. And, and, and the movement, well, the message, particularly that the movement has been given. You know, but yeah. The message of chronology. Yeah, that leads to July 18th and all the other dates. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
Samson goes to Gaza, which means he, he must go south. And if we're taking this in the ironic sense, then he is going to another message. Would that be correct? Um, well, I don't know if I would put it that way. Now, um, you're saying he's going south, and his how? Where is he going from? Well, you're looking at a map or something. No, I'm doing this by memory. Okay, because Samson would have lived in the territory of Dan, which was just about to the central portion of Israel, just a bit north of Judah. Okay, but the question is, where was he before? When it, you know, or because isn't he well, in the area of the Philistines more? When when we're talking about this from chapter fifteen. We know that his, 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 the one that he had chosen to marry was living further north than Gaza. Because okay. God, Gaza is south almost toward Egypt. Okay. Yeah. So, well, yeah. So we have the Gaza Strip, right? And we have the city of Rafia is is in the Gaza Strip. Right. Um, and the city of Gaza is, um, according to the commentary, they're 22 miles apart. That is, Gaza is 22 miles south of Rafia. Of course, there's another symbol, which is reunion. Yeah, yeah restoration so um so the city of gaza but see i don't know this doesn't make sense to me looking on a map um okay so here they say gaza city of great antiquity was situated between rafia and Ascalon, 22 miles north of the former oh so um, the former is Raphia. I was doing this backwards. And 60 miles south of the latter. Right. Okay. Yeah, I got that Does back. that make better sense to you? Yeah. Okay. So Gaza is north of Raphia. You're saying that he was coming from the north. Correct. He's going to be, he's going towards, uh, so he's not leaving Raphia. He's heading towards Raphia. Correct. Okay, which is an important point. But he's now, where is he in chapter 15? What city is this? This was okay. Timna. In where, chapter 14, he goes to Timna, right? Yeah. So where is that in relationship to these other places? Timna is just the other side of the border from where he was born. Okay. And it's not one of the central cities of the Philistines. No. You have the five cities of the Philistines. Yeah. Ascalon is one. Gath is one. I believe Gaza is one. And then there's two others. So we know in this situation that he goes in chapter 15, he returns to Timnah. Mm -hmm. He's denied his wife. The father-in-law offers his younger daughter, sister to his wife, which would have been another thing prohibited because you, you are not to... 
enter into covenant, especially the covenant of marriage with two sisters. Now, Samson, when he chooses to place the firebrands between the tails of the foxes, he then goes to the rock of Etam. Right? Etam? Yes. Etam is in Judah. It is not in Philistia. Yeah. That's why the, Jew, the, the men of Judah are there. Correct. But when he then comes and is delivered up to the Philistines, God opens up this fountain in Lehi. Yeah. All of this is a bit north of Gaza. Okay. Yeah, and of course, most stuff is north of Gaza. But, but yeah, that makes more sense. Okay, so... So we have there, then he's going to see this harlot goes in unto her and then it was told the Gazite saying Samson has come hither and they compassed him they laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night saying in the morning when it is day we shall kill him and Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight and took the doors to the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them bar and all and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of an hill that is before Hebron so we, we talked about this before when we studied it previously. Right. So uh, this is quite a distance. Agreed. Yeah. So it, it's interesting, too, you know, from Spirit of Prophecy. Not only did the men of the city of Gaza encompass him, they sent for reinforcements. Now, we would find that in Signs of the Times, October 13th of 1881. Okay. So, as Mrs. White wrote, the disgraceful fact was soon made known to the inhabitants of the city who were eager to be avenged upon their dreaded foe. They had not forgotten what had happened, either with the foxes or with the slaying of the thousand. Fearing to attack him, however, they sent for reinforcements and kept a vigilant watch at the gate of the city, determined by some means to put him to death in the morning. Yeah. Now he's going to rise at midnight. Correct. So, so, so I'm taking this, my understanding of this is this midnight symbol is obviously important. And this is this message. Uh, now, how we looked at the gates and the two posts, I don't remember before, but in the context of what we've seen already, I would relate these to these two messages, to Collins and Odilio's messages. Okay, then is the symbol of the harlot of Gaza important here too? And how would we, how would we relate that with this? Well, I mean, so so we have a heart. This would represent a message that is um, I mean, because we could take it morally ironic, right? I mean, we could say, I mean, you could take if we were to take an application that this referred to Christ, Samson refers to Christ. I mean, we could see that 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 Christ comes to this earth. And, and that his church is a harlot, right? Okay. I mean, they've played the harlot. That's really clear. And that this is Christ coming to save his people. But we would be taking that story ironically, right? Morally ironically. In the context of which we've been placing this story, 
we've been uh, using Ezra, you know, seven to 10. Um, and especially this first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month in relationship to the divorcing of the strange wives. And we've been taking these symbols like strange wives, harlots, so forth, representing um, that this message needs to be purified from the false system of study, right? That we've been making applications because we're not aware that we're not using Miller's rules. Right. So that, that there's a way in which we've studied that is a mixture of truth and error. But God is still giving us light in spite of that. It's just that we need to separate the precious from the vile. Right. We haven't had, um, we haven't seen the effect of Parminder's message, particularly upon our message, upon our understanding of the lines. And how it has affected us. So we believe that God's given us light regarding the lines in this study, that we understand them much better than we did before. And we can take what Colin and Odilia have presented and see that their conclusions that they draw, and particularly with, with Colin, it has to do with Trump having to become president again, which is wrong. And with Odilio, it's the conspiracy theories that he mingles in with his um, analysis, his chronological analysis of events. That's the way that I would characterize it. So we know that they're going to be looking at the morning, right? In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. But Samson is going to get up at midnight. Midnight, of course, is an important symbol. Uh, in, in some ways, we, we can say that our line is a zoom into midnight on the line above us, right? So, um, so we know we have Ellen White's line, which has the Sunday law. Our line is a zoom into that Sunday law. So it, it produces 1989, 9-11, midnight and midnight cry, etc. But that this movement is a zoom into that midnight waymark itself, that it's expanding that midnight waymark as we're approaching midnight. Similar to Samuel Snow's letters, his letters that uh, July 18th, three days before midnight, that's his last letter before midnight, and those are um, aligning in and of itself prior to midnight. And so we believe that we're Samuel Snow's letters. That's what the movement is at the present time. And so we're still approaching midnight so that um, this message of Samson's um, will arise at midnight. And it's going to take the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts. So we have the posts, uh, but also the two doors. And he's going to carry them bar and all, put them upon his shoulders and carry them up to the top of an hill that is before Hebron. Now, <clears throat> again, referring to the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. And if we are applying some of this in the morally ironic manner, spirit of prophecy says at midnight, Samson was aroused. We're agreed on that point. The accusing voice of conscience filled him with remorse as he remembered that he had broken his vow as a Nazarite. Now, is this accusing voice of conscience another type of a midnight cry? Um, I don't know if I would do that. Okay. But <clears throat> this accusing voice of conscience filled him with remorse as he remembered that he had broken his vow as a Nazarite. Is the accusing voice of conscience before us right now that we are remembering we have not properly applied Miller's rules within this message? Mm -hmm. 
So you're, you would agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, the whole thing of coming to the upper room, all these different things are all connected with that. Okay. So despite his sin, God's mercy had not forsaken him. His great strength again served to deliver him. Wrenching the city gate from its place, he took it entire with its posts and bars and carried it several miles to the top of a hill on the way to Hebron. The guards, meanwhile, being too much surprised and terrified to intercept or pursue him. Okay. How would we apply the guards being too terrified and why carrying it to Hebron? What's important of it being carried on the way to Hebron? Hmm. Well, what is Hebron particularly? I mean, what is the significance of it? That was where the fathers were, were buried. So uh, Abraham and Isaac. Okay, so it's the burial place of Abraham, Isaac, etc. Well, it's also yeah. it's also the place where Abraham dwelt in the plain of Mamre which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. That's our first mention in Genesis 13, 8. Yeah. But it is interesting if we look at it as the burial place of the fathers, that that would relate to the pioneers. Right. I mean, so both these would be significant, uh, the first mention and also uh, the purpose that it had uh, for burial. Okay. So, I mean, that would fit in with what we're already saying about this. So what would these doors and these two posts and the bar, what would these represent? <clears throat> Weren't you just making the application that those are the messages of uh, Colin and Odilio? Yeah. Yeah, but we have doors of the gate of the city and the two posts, right? So we got these posts, which uh, door post, and then we have the bar. I remember last time saying that the door posts and the bar reminded me of Christ's cross. He's yep. ascending a hill. Yeah. Now, the bar here refers to the bolt, that is the, the lock, the bolt of, of the gates or the doors. Um, so he's going to take that, and, and that would be something that, um, you know, the opening of the doors, so the key, I guess. Um, And of course, midnight, it's interesting here that midnight is, um, I mean, the half or the middle, right? The midst, uh, the two parts. And then the, the word for night, so it's two different words, middle of the night. And the word for night is Lila 3915. 
that symbol shows up again. Um, so this message, Odilio's and Colin's messages, they're going to, um, Samson at midnight is going to arise and carry these messages and present them on a, put them on a top of a hill. So this would be a proclamation of a message, would it not? I think that logical. And and if we're going to take this, uh, that is before Hebron. So this is where the ancestors are buried, but also it, it would represent then uh, the Seventh Day Adventist Church, the Levites, uh, those that need to hear this message. You know, if we were going to put something at um, April 5th, 2030, not saying that we would have uh, that actual date, but if we're going to say what we're, we're heading to, uh, we're heading to, to a time when this movement is going to be united to give a message. We would agree with that. Whether that's April 5th, 2030, literally, or whether it just symbolizes that, uh, the period of the divorcement ending. So that, so what we're, we're having is we're having something that's symbolically represented as midnight for this movement. And we know that that's Boston. Right, July 21st, 1844. And, but that's not the empowerment of the message. Right, that's just the message is, is proclaimed. So in this interpretation, this would fit in with what we're already understanding. But it adds some more detail. It's also interesting because the the distance from Gaza, with Gaza being almost to the coast to Hebron, is presumed to be something over 35 miles. Yeah, something like that. I mean, there isn't presently like a direct road. Right. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard figure out and and for some reason on uh, google maps you can't actually they won't give you the distance because i guess you can't just travel that from palestine to Hebron. you can't drive it yeah if there if there was a straight flight line from gaza to hebron it'd be 38 miles yeah okay 70 kilometers or something like that 61 61 okay 61 kilometers 38 miles does it make sense i'm just looking at at one right now on a map which i hadn't done before now maybe their maybe their calculation is incorrect because it's saying that 38 flight miles would be equivalent to 61 kilometer or 33 nautical miles okay i guess that's right yeah it's uh, yeah it's 61 okay that makes it doesn't make sense to me but i guess that must be correct oh yeah that makes sense I'm just getting mixed up with these numbers here. Yeah, because it's 42. Okay, never mind. <clears throat> yeah, because um, 60 kilometers is, 
Yeah, about uh, 35 miles an hour. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so that's quite a distance that he's going to carry these. Now, right. um, so we don't know the actual distance, you know, that he would have traveled. Now, it's interesting, too, um, because in this story, uh, it's, he's going to be carrying these gates with these two posts. Right. And we know that it's going to be these these columns that uh, is at the end where he's going to experience the cross. So in some ways, this is prefiguring the cross. Now, again, you know, so we have this Judges 16 because, you know, we tied it to to Colin's message in chapter 15 with the, with the Pentecost, right? And 16.1 is going to be the wave offering. So we have these two messages tied together here. So it makes sense that this is going to be Collins and Odilio's messages. But they have their time, right? So at some point, my understanding is that we will understand um, these messages as we study them together. We will, we will have greater light or greater significance. That is, this movement still doesn't have a message to give to the Levites at the present time. We have a message for ourselves, but we don't have a message for the church. Now, and I, don't, I personally don't think it's going to be like, um, you know, this is something we could get done in like a month or something. This is a period of time of study that this movement has to go through. Now, if I'm if I'm understanding this right, if Gaza is close to being on the sea coast, yeah. Gaza would be, let's say, roughly. I'm 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 looking and doing a calculation here. That Gaza would be about 128 feet above sea level. Okay. Hebron. If I have the right data. Would be about three thousand, almost thirty-one hundred feet above sea level. Okay, so about uh, thousand meters. Uh, Nine hundred forty-three. Yeah. Yeah. That's. That means that Samson would have been carrying this gate. Bars, posts, everything uphill. Yeah. That's over quite a distance, though. But yeah, it is uphill. Doesn't that represent the fact that we've had an uphill climb to be able to present this message before other brothers and sisters? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, well, so we got an uphill climb. Yeah. I mean, so much of what we've been studying right now has been not easily accepted. by others they're kind of terrified of it 
Some are trying to say that, you know, this is nothing more than numerology. Some are trying to say that this, this has nothing to do with what we're dealing with. Yet all of it is presented within the Bible and there's nothing that is unimportant within scripture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's definitely... Um... A lot of things we have to sort out. I mean, so it's not it's not the simplest. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, it it seems to me pretty clear that these symbols um, that we have here relate to our message. You know, and even when we start getting into the story of Delilah, as we know, Delilah, um, the Hebrew number from Strong's is 1807. So that gives you July 18th. But, you know, we look at Delilah as, well, this Philistine woman, right? Um, but we, we take this story and we look at it ironically. So Delilah is <clears throat> this message. And I know I'm jumping ahead here looking at this story, but but I think it relates back to what we see with this woman that's a harlot. So even though this is a harlot, as, as we see in the book of Hosea, Hosea um, we have this... Um, uh, so the book of Hosea also connects with Judges 16 regarding Christ coming down to win his church from whoring. I think the harlot in Gaza and 2 Samuel 1 verse 20 are tied. Daughters of Philistia rejoice, triumph, triumph. and uh, Philistines wanted to defeat Samson in Judges 16, and the harlot was to be, in their view, a means of snaring him. So, um, you know, when we take this, what God is doing, because the whole reason of this ironic story, as I understand it, is to show us really that we are sinners and that Christ took upon himself our nature, came to redeem us. Um, but he overcomes our nature. Because this is our nature. This is a nature that is sinful. Right. So it's, it's representing the human nature of Christ on 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 its outworking of sin, but it's showing symbolically his victory over this nature. So if we, we just apply it to Christ, we can see how Samson typifies Christ in that way. But then when we make the application to this movement, we see the symbols that God has given us regarding this movement. Which, which are really hard, uh, you know, to not ignore. I mean, they're, they're easy to see. I mean, we have the midnight, we have um, uh, the symbol of 16 verse 1 tied to what we saw in, in 15 verse 1. And we know 15 verse 1 also represents... Um, uh, the you know Daniel chapter five so so it relates to the twenty five twenty as well so there, there's just so many different connections I mean I, to go through them all would take take time but I think this would finish off the story of chapter fifteen but just like we had fifteen we have this story at the beginning regarding the wheat harvest. And the 300 foxes, now we have this story here regarding the gates. And so there's something here that we're, we're not seeing completely. 
So I'm struggling trying to figure out exactly what it is we're seeing with these gates. I mean, we can, yeah, we can relate them to Collins and Odilio's messages. But just like we had the foxes that were tied tail to tail with the firebrand in between, right? We can see the parallel in this story. It's sort of the same idea, but illustrated differently. So now we got the two gates with the two posts and and the the lock, you know, the bolt. And he's going to carry these up to the top of an hill that is before Hebron. Okay, so anything more that we can glean from this? And Caleb was given Hebron by Judah. Some of the meanings of Hebron are society, league, etc. Um, so we got seat of association david christ was king of hebron king over us okay so how would we apply that what angela wrote there in the chat regarding hebron What I'm trying to do is just share that I believe that we need to come fully to Christ. Sorry, I'm having neurological and computer problems here. And um, it's a repentance. And I think the message we need to get to the church as we get to anybody is give yourself totally to Christ. Mm -hmm. Now we do let know. Him be, let him be your king. We do know this is the message God's giving to us, right, through these studies. Yes. I mean, yes. And then we in turn give it to others. And if we can give nothing else to others or to the church, to anybody, it's the simple message of salvation, the full repentance in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to testify that I got up this morning and I've got tingling and numbness just about everywhere. And it's a weird uh, neuro neurological or uh, neuro neuropathological thing. So I'm going to ask for prayer, but I've been really, really praying that I can function at all today. And I know this has been an improvement, but if brethren, if you keep praying for me, because I want to live and I want to be used by God. Okay. That will be prayer for you. Um. One other thing uh, just to note here um, is uh, the word Delilah. Um, now, this word, uh, 1807. So I know I'm moving ahead to Delilah here, but I was just relating this to these doors. Um, you'll see that the, the Hebrew number there, Adelet, or that's really that how you pronounce the fourth letter of the Hebrew alphabet because it's just a door, Dalit. Um, so it says this is something swinging that is a valve of a door, a two-leaved gate, leaf lid. Now we can see that Delilah is is a similar word. It doesn't have the th at the end, but it has that del at the beginning, right? So. Um, you know, is there any connection between, because we have the 1817 is the Hebrew number for doors, right, or door. And then we have 1807 is the Hebrew number for Delilah. Um, can we look at these doors as representing July 18th? Or connected to July 18th. You understand what I'm asking? Because these are a chiasm, right? Doors are really a chiasm, are they not? They can be. And and the bar is at the center, generally, of the doors. It it 
stop you from opening the doors, right? So you have the bar that goes in between these locks, right? And you can lock it. Um, you know, it's the bolt. Um, and then when, when we think about this, this word doors um, often refers to like to leave it gates, right? So there's the doors, they're open in the middle. Remember with Cyrus, right? He was prophesied of that they would open before him the two leaded gates and the gate shall not be shut. Can we relate? And that's in Isaiah 45, right? Excuse me. And Cyrus also has one of the meanings of his name is son. And then you have Samson with a similar name. Yeah, and son. Jesus in Malachi 4 is our son. Yeah. Now, and then we also have, so, I mean, looking at these Hebrews numbers, I know is kind of an odd thing to do, but we have uh, also the word uh, top. So it goes to the top of the hill. Now we know that that's just the word uh, uh, Rosh, right? So we've seen this word before. I mean, it's chief or head, you know, it's the first word in the Bible. Um, so it's the, the chief word of the Bible. The head of the Bible is the word Rosh, right? The Bible starts with this word. And, and it's 7218. So it has all the numbers of July 18, 2020 in it. Um, and so this word is actually an important Hebrew word, even in spite of the symbols that it has in the Hebrew number. Um, but can we see that this is all about um, this message of July 18 that is is really the, that's being brought to the top of the hill? And I don't really know how, how to understand that, because one of the problems that I had with July 18 is that I didn't understand how this message, especially after it passed, but even before, um, without the event, how this symbol or this understanding of July 18th as a symbol, how we could communicate that to others who haven't passed through this history. Because we still don't really have a message to give, from my perspective. I mean, I've written a lot of papers, people have read lots of them online. But I don't know if people really can appreciate what these papers mean, what these conclusions mean. It's like trying to explain what happened on October 22nd, 1844, if people have not entered into the most holy place with Christ. Now, all these events, I mean, we have to take them all by faith that this is what God is indicating and this is what God is doing. And I mean, who can see into into that realm, the spiritual realm and see what Christ is doing right now? What did he accomplish on July 18th, 2020? Was it similar to what he accomplished on October 22nd, 1844? I suspect in some ways it must have been. Hmm. So with the door there, yes, uh, this is a test that it's either all going to be open or closed to us. And we just need to believe this is where God is leading us and accept it for now and wait for him to reveal more to us. I mean, I know there are many things that we will not understand while we're in these mortal bodies, while we're on this evil planet. And we will in the hereafter if we don't understand them now. Yeah, and and. See, the problem I have, I mean, this message is so personal to me, right? That, and I know that I understand it, but I don't know that I could make it understandable to others. So God would have to do that. You know, and, it, and it's such a personal message. I mean, I look at the fact, you know, when I turned 17 on February 6, you know, 1980, 187 days later, I'm going to wish this Perseid meteor shower on August 11th, 1980. And then the number of days that the manna fell, 
later is going to be July 18, 2020. And so the problem that I have is I look at this message, so much of the symbolism is personal to me. And, um, you know, and even if I look at, you know, I was 17 and then August 11th has the, the 18 in there, right? And I turned 17 on February, you know, February 6th. But, you know, we have all these symbols of, you know, the 187 and July 18, 2020. So I don't know how to how to give a message that that's so tied to me personally, if that makes sense. Because I, I mean, I guess the problem is when we look at ourselves, um, you know, we know we're sinners. We know that we don't represent Christ, and people could easily look at our lives and and misrepresent them and even they don't even have to misrepresent them they can represent them correctly but you know the the big fear i guess is that you know we are not perfect right we've have these pasts we have these weaknesses in character and yet i see that this message is really about in order to present this message to the Levites, it's Christ's character seen upon his people. So this brings us to a much greater and deeper consecration than what we have experienced before. Amen. Well, you know, the first thing I was led to do, one of the first things I was led to do this morning is to read Isaiah 53. And it says, in the third verse, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as that were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. We're going to face the same thing. We already have. We already will be. And, you know, like the Lord said, the Lord is just testing me quite frequently now. Just keep, keep going. Like I will supply the healing basically is what he's saying. And you just keep, keep going, keep learning, keep growing, keep doing what you're doing and more, you know, because if, if I gave way to fear, Theodore, I would be dead. I really believe that. There's several times in the past couple of years, I really thought I was going to die. And the last time I thought it was going to be in, in real peace. But I said, Lord, I am not going to, if you want me to live, I don't want to die right now. I, I, I could in perfect peace right now. I really felt this slipping away and, and I was in a total peace, right? But I said, if you want to still live, me, let me live. If you want to use me, then you're going to have to empower me. And it's just like this morning. I mean, I don't know. People wake up and they're tingling all over and, and their head feels heavy and they feel like they're going to pass out. And they feel like they're losing function where they're, they're, they're going to be paralyzed. It, it can be scary. And I just don't want to panic. I just want to trust him for healing and to go on with him. And I mean, I read what Ellen White had. Sounds like she had a heart attack once. She had paralyzing okay. strokes. She had all kinds so you're of just, You're just grabbing me now, though, Angela. You've got to rein you you got to rein you in here a little bit. You're just going. Yeah, I, but I'm trying to inspire people because they're going to get attacked by Satan. They're going to get attacked by right. things that are floating around. And and this is the stand that we need to take. Yeah. So we know that God you can't give way to fear is what I'm trying to say, because I'm learning these lessons myself. I just want to share them. Right. So nothing that comes to us doesn't first go through Christ. He allows everything. to exactly. happen. And he has a purpose in the things that have happened. And he gives light for our feet. He doesn't, um, you know, God doesn't give us a million dollars. He gives us our daily bread. Right. Right. He doesn't give us everything all at once that we need. And, and so God keeps providing for us spiritually and physically as we need him. We go on day by day. We have light for our feet. And so even though we can't see what's ahead. We can see that he's leading because we can see what's behind. Right. The light of the midnight cry shines all along the path. So that's why we're studying these things. So, yeah, so your testimony there is very powerful in, in that in spite of our defects of character, 
in spite of the weakness and the frailty of humanity, God has a purpose for us. Amen. And so. I, there's a lady down the road that I wanted to see. I met her spouse a few days ago, and he asked me to come and speak to her because she is housebound and basic, almost totally paralyzed by the sounds of it. So because I was sharing with him how God has been healing me, he yeah. thought maybe I could help her. That's why I you know just thinking now, that's probably why I got this attack today. Could be. Oh okay. yeah, I think I think I think it's connected. Yeah. Okay, so so now in uh, our time is up. So we got through the first three verses there of Judges 16, finished up some things with Judges or Judges 15, and now we're in Judges 16. So we're gonna need to close with prayer. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. Uh, continue, we ask, uh, to work in our lives, um, to guide us each day. Uh, we pray for Angela and her ministry and for all of our ministries, the people around us that you have given for us to witness to. Uh, we ask, Lord, that your angels can be about us and that your Holy Spirit can speak to each heart. Help us to uh, cling to Christ and to see things from uh, an eternal view instead of being caught up in the events of the moment. Help us to have patience as we walk along this path, patience with others, patience with ourselves. And um, we pray, Lord, that uh, the study that we do will strengthen and encourage us. So be with each person we ask, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.